In the last video, part one of this series, we covered the background and associated geography of the Battle of Inkerman. As well, we conducted a short examination of the armies, their equipment, and weaponry. Here, in part two of the series, we'll examine infantry formations, tactics, and maneuver, as well as after a short review of the ground, take a closer look at the important preliminary action known as the Battle of Little Inkerman, fought on the 26th of October, the day after the epic clash at Balaclava. Before carrying on, mention must be made of some of the historical or ahistorical details that may or may not be present in this series. Please, if you haven't watched part one yet, there is considerable discussion surrounding the kit and the arm used in this series that explains some of the economies that were necessary in its production. While not, perhaps, being completely correct in detail, everything is completely correct in spirit. Despite the adoption of the rifle for all units, its issue had hardly begun to influence tactics and maneuver. Indeed, the P-51 Minier rifle had only been issued immediately prior to sailing to the Crimea, and even some units receiving the bulk of their issue during the voyage. At this time, armies generally hadn't faced massed rifle fire before, and therefore its new and decisive effects on the battlefield would be absorbed gradually, influencing steadily the tactics of the day. Going into the Crimean War, the army relied on the text of the 1833 Field Exercise and Evolutions of the Army. This had been abridged in 1847, and this later volume, the so-titled Infantry Manual, was a handier reference for drill up to battalion level, as well as the manual and platoon exercises. In it were the standard evolutions of line and column and interestingly a rather large chapter on light infantry, something that by the 1850s most if not all companies and battalions were capable of. As alluded to in part one of this series, a battalion was made up of eight service companies, two of which had the traditional title of grenadier and light company, and would take up positions on the right and left respectively. The remaining companies were simply numbered, although there were some examples of companies being lettered within the battalion. Among other distinctions, the companies were distinguished by the tufts they wore on their shakos, the Grenadier Company having one that was all white, and the Light Company having one that was green. The battalion companies had a two-thirds, one-third split between white over red. The battalion was commanded by a lieutenant colonel, with a series of officers, both commissioned and non-commissioned, to assist him. Due to sickness, leave, or death, often positions were filled by more junior subordinates. The battalion was broken down into halves, or wings, comprised of four companies each. Nominally, these would be commanded by one of the two majors within the battalion. The eight companies were the maneuver units within the battalion, and although doctrinally the battalion was the basic unit for battlefield action, the companies were the vehicles for maneuver and fire. Formed in two ranks, they were nominally commanded by a captain who took post on the right flank of his company, covered by his color sergeant and the remaining subalterns and sergeants took post in the third or supernumerary rank. The company also had a drummer, or sometimes two, for signaling on the bugle and beating routine calls while in camp. Although nominally over 100 men, including detachments to the band and drums, while on campaign and certainly by Inkerman, the ranks of all companies were much reduced. Here is shown a company of 68 all ranks, including three officers, four sergeants, and 30 files, or 60 men as well as the attending drummer. Here, in a real-world example, is the diminished light company of the 38th foot, taken in 1855 after the Battle of Inkerman and the winter that followed. They have but 15 files, or 30 men, in the ranks. For more complicated maneuver, the company was broken down, or to use the military term, told off, into a number of different groupings two subdivisions or half companies, and four sections. They were also numbered in threes for reforming into a smaller formation used in extremely tight terrain. Each man was allotted a space of 21 inches and therefore 30 files took up between 18 and 20 yards frontage. As you can tell, this is not at all a large space. Despite its relatively small size, for flexibility in closer country or along roads or tracks, 
a number of other options were available. The company could maneuver by subdivisions. Here, one such evolution is shown, forming open column of subdivisions to the right, and indeed this could be done to the left as well. By wheeling the subdivisions in behind each other, the frontage of the company could thus be reduced. Another variation included the use of the four sections. By wheeling each section, the company frontage could be reduced even further, and thus could fit down roads or through defiles. Now, of course, there were many, many other techniques at the company level, but these are perhaps outside the scope of this video. Thus formed and trained, the company took its place in the line with the other seven of the battalion. The colors were placed in the middle to provide for direction and orientation. Formed up in close order, the usual formation with the men shoulder to shoulder, the battalion could cover a frontage of some 150 yards. Now battalion strength would obviously play a conspicuous part in this distance, and many battalions were well under strength, numbering closer to 500 than the thousand they were supposed to have. For maneuver or staging, a selection of column formations could be used. The various spaces between the companies, each of which was in line, was reflected in the name of the formation. Open column saw that distance between companies equal to their frontage, while quarter distance reflected a fourth of that distance. Close column would see the companies closed right up with only one pace between them. These were certainly not fighting formations. Here we can see some basic uses of these formations. A battalion could move in line with all companies beside one another. It could also move in column. It could change between the two using a number of differing techniques, one of which is shown here, forming line from open column to the left flank. Open column afforded the space for the companies to wheel into line, thus presenting a formed body ready to fight. The same principle could also be applied to the use of subdivisions. Next to maneuver, one of the most important aspects in the era of the muzzle-loading musket, whether rifled or not, was its rate of fire, some three rounds a minute. This necessitated a certain degree of density on the battlefield in order to achieve the volume of fire that would be required to be effective. This was delivered in one of two ways while in close order, either by volley or by file firing. Volley firing could be done in certain circumstances by one gigantic battalion volley with all companies firing at the same time. This was perhaps not the normal thing to do, as one, communicating this order in the din of battle across some 150 to 200 yards would be very difficult, and it also left the battalion completely unloaded, despite the effect of its fire. Perhaps a more common technique was to rely on company volleys. Present! These could be delivered in sequence, starting from either flank or simultaneously from both. Each company would ready and present in sequence until each had delivered their fire. Then, generally, the companies would be free to fire as they were ready, independent of one another. Of particular interest, as shown in the earlier demonstration, there was no command fire at this time. The men simply presented and gave their fire after a small pause, whilst ensuring their point of aim was correct. Present! The second way that fire could be delivered was by file firing. This was a company technique that was the independent fire of the era. Here, either from one flank or both simultaneously, the men of a file presented and gave their fire in sequence, creating a methodical ripple effect. Commence firing! Although shown here from the right, it could be executed by subdivisions or by sections, depending on circumstances. Once the sequence was complete, the men of any file were free then to engage in their own time, always ensuring that one man was loaded before the other gave their fire. Fire could also be delivered in extended order. By its very nature, this would create somewhat of a lesser volume of fire. 
Therefore, the operations conducted in extended order would typically be those of peripheral action, skirmishing, and screening. As would figure prominently at Inkerman, in contrast to the conventional wisdom regarding extended order tactics, this technique would be used extensively, many times out of necessity for more deliberate and decisive actions. Previously in the century, the preserve of the Light Company, or Light Infantry Regiments, extended order tactics were, by the 1850s, well within the capabilities of any company within the battalion. Thus, the titles of the flank companies were simply traditional by this time. Extended order saw the files open up with any number of paces between them. Covering a much greater frontage, the men could maneuver much more easily through broken terrain. While outwardly, this sounds like something a unit would always want to achieve. But we must remember that in the era of muzzleloading arms, it was necessary to achieve a certain amount of density in the line in order to attain the desired volume of fire. Therefore, extended order tactics were generally used for periphery activities, screening and skirmishing, while any heavy, serious clash would be handled in close order. Here, we'll work through one of the many evolutions used to adopt extended order. With the company fallen in as part of the battalion, it would be necessary to advance a certain distance before extending. Thus, the command, quick march, would be given, and the company would advance to the desired position. After halting, the order to extend from the center could be given. Although, depending on circumstances, this could be done from either the left or the right flank instead. On the word extend, the directing file, that in the center, stood fast, while the others faced outwards and began marching in quick time to their flanks. Once the file was at the desired number of paces from that behind them, the file halted, fronted, and adopted whatever position was prudent. Here, the kneeling position. The evolution continued until both flanks of the company were extended, the officers and NCOs taking post behind in the supernumerary rank. While a modest four paces was used in this example, theoretically any number of paces between files could be used, depending on the circumstances. The men worked in their files, and when it came time to engage the enemy, they would do so one at a time, with the rear rank men covering ever so slightly to the right to afford him the ability to fire past his file mate. Commence firing! Each man would cover their file mate until they were loaded and ready to fire. You'll at once notice the peculiar way that the front rank and then the rear rank man conduct their loading evolution. The front rank man was always to place the butt of his weapon down the left side of his body, keeping it close. This way, the muzzle could be lowered far enough to make it easy to load. As we'll see momentarily, the rear rank man oriented his weapon with the butt forward on the ground and the muzzle pointed to the rear, all the while maintaining his weapon on the right side of the file. Ready. Once the musket was capped, the rear rank man could then give his fire. Of particular use while in extended order, the bugle provided for the ability to communicate outside of vocal range. While there was a well-established system used to command troops, especially those in extended order on the battlefield, the use of the bugle could be fraught with difficulty. Misinterpretation of sometimes complex calls and commands could lead to disaster. Anecdotal evidence suggests that this instrument was used sparingly in action. Although it may appear somewhat pedantic, showing only one file in action, when combined with the rest of the company, the fire would have been consistent if not particularly heavy. With the use of extended order, a single company could often extend to the same frontage as would typically be occupied by an entire battalion. The ground, the weather, and the enemy would all combine to govern the extension in paces between files. Extensive use of this type of fighting in the broken scrubland of the battlefield would rely on individual awareness and instinct much more so than in close order, and would be one reason that the battle would be forever known as the soldier's battle. Of course, it's crucial to understand that although all these tactics and techniques were well known and practiced by all battalions, the incredibly complex terrain, often covered by a thicket of scrub, would play havoc with the drillbook theory. Ad hoc groupings, maneuvering under junior officers or NCOs, delivering their fire in sometimes unconventional ways, using unconventional formations would be commonplace. And, as we shall see, 
Weather conditions would play a pivotal role come the day of the 5th of November. Russian tactics and formations would seem to be in somewhat of a juxtaposition to the linear British ones, relying on mass and shock to achieve the desired effect on the battlefield. A typical formation used at Inkerman was the Battalion Attack Column. This saw the four large companies of a battalion, numbering somewhere between 150 and 200 men each, formed in a three-rank line, arranged one behind the other. This was typically a much more dense formation than the British open column and in concept be closer to a quarter or close column in spacing. Easy to control and maneuver, it relied on shock and mass to carry an attack. Another formation that was used was the battalion in company columns. This saw the company's two platoons arranged one behind the other. Three of the companies were arranged in a line with the fourth in support some distance behind. This allowed for easier movement through broken terrain and could be used with skirmishers deployed to the front, formed from the third rank of the companies, leaving them formed in two ranks. Both methods were used extensively, although the broken terrain and congested nature of much of the fighting led many formations to disintegrate into unformed groups or mobs. Unlike the Battle of the Elma, where a formal, deliberate attack was mounted with nearly all the battalions in the army, in line formation, Inkerman was a completely different case. In order to understand the context of the innumerable moves and commitment of forces, we must first understand the fabric of the routine functioning of the army while besieging Sevastopol. In order to protect itself while encamped before Sevastopol, the army relied on the time-honored practices of the picket system to provide for security and early warning of attack. The elements of the system were thus. With the main body of the army in camp, there needed to be some form of protection against surprise attack, especially at night. This was done by groups of men drawn from the main body and placed at intervals across the front, covering likely enemy approaches and generally forming somewhat of a chain. These small groups were known as pickets and would typically be based on a company of about 50 men or so. From the picket's position, usually somewhere moderately defensible, such as a farm or other suitable ground, a series of sentries would be pushed out. These could be single or double sentries, depending on the risk and the time of day. Individual sentries would spend relatively short amounts of time on guard, two hours or so, after which they would be relieved by others from the picket. This way, sentries could be kept alert, and those not on guard could rest. If an attack was made, the sentries would engage briefly, before moving back towards the picket's position, where they could join the remainder. The picket commander could then send a message to raise the alarm at the main camp, and fight in his location to stall or slow the attack, and buy time for the main body to stand to and prepare for action. The pickets were the eyes and ears of a static army, and their timely intervention in any attack would buy time for the main body to stand to. And if it looked like a general action was developing, the remainder of the sentries would fall back on their respective picket positions. As the action developed, the pickets would fall back generally towards the camp location, where they would meet the remainder of the main body and prepare for action. The ground of the battlefield of Inkerman is quite complex, and perhaps a review using a slightly different approach might be useful. The battlefield lay to the east of Sevastopol and took place on what could be generally called the Inkerman Heights although it is referred to by different names in various texts and accounts. The Inkerman Heights lay at the northeast corner of the Hersonese Plateau and were linked back to the south at Balaclava by the edge of the high ground known as the Sapoon Heights. These overlooked the plain on which the Battle of Balaclava had been fought and through which the Chernaya River ran its course past the ruins of Inkerman on its way to Sevastopol Harbour. At the south end of the Inkerman Heights was a low rise known as Home Ridge, behind which was the northernmost British camp, that of the 2nd Division. Home Ridge extended out to the west, down to the Mikryakov Spur. It also extended off its eastern end to the north, in a feature known as Four Ridge, the whole forming somewhat of an L-shaped rise. Leading off from Four Ridge, the Kitspur projected out over the river 
atop which was the sandbag battery, which was still in place, despite the guns being withdrawn and its purpose made redundant. Adjacent to the Kitspur was the prominent Inkerman Tusk, with St. Clement's Ravine running between. This would prove to be a useful route to the heights for the Russians. To the north of the Inkerman Tusk lay the Quarry Ravine, which had, along its length, the post road, which led to and over Home Ridge. A feature known as the East Jut rose to the north of Quarry Ravine and formed its western slopes. To the west, the Volovia Gorge would also see much use as the Russian attacks developed. Importantly, the Volovia Gorge was easily accessible to Russian troops coming from the interior of their Crimea, thus delivering them straight to Shell Hill. This, combined with St. George's Ravine further west, were the two main access routes to the heights that would be used on the 5th of November. The high ground at the top of St. George's Ravine was known as St. George's Brow, and would figure prominently later on. At the western end of the heights, they were accessed by the Sapper Road, which ran from Sevastopol. South of the Inkerman Heights, was Victoria Ridge, on which was situated the Lancaster Battery, its single large 68-pounder being used to engage the works at Sevastopol. Running between the Victoria Ridge and the Inkerman Heights was the Carinage Ravine. It had a number of spurs that overlooked its lower elevations. One of these was known as the West Jut. This, and features like it, formed many re-entrants and routes up to the heights two of which were the Mikryakov Glen and, on the other side of the Mikryakov Spur, the Wellway. The Wellway being of particular note as leading almost directly to the rear of the 2nd Division camp. Of course, the dominant point on the heights was Shell Hill, which although not towering, did give somewhat of an advantage over the slightly lower Home Ridge and the camp of the 2nd Division behind it. Across the top of Home Ridge was the aforementioned breastwork, constructed by the gunners of the Divisional Artillery. This was augmented further forward by another fortification known as the Barrier, which, positioned at the top of the Quarry Ravine, also blocked the post road. These were both significant, if not dominating, defensive works, and would prove to be critical in the upcoming actions. Thus it was that the men of the 2nd Division spent the night of the 25th of October. They had probably heard of the destruction of the light cavalry down on the plain before Balaclava, and were wondering what the prospects for further Russian incursions may be. The routine change of pickets was early in the morning, near 5 o'clock, and the new companies had taken their positions, relieving those from the day and night before. Prospects for a long 24-hour tour of duty were poor. There were a total of eight pickets on the Inkerman Heights, four from each brigade of the 2nd Division. Those of the 1st Brigade formed the right pickets, and those of the 2nd, the left. Ordinarily, a given battalion would field two pickets at a time, but on the 26th of October, arrangements were somewhat different. The right pickets formed from the 1st Brigade began on the northern slopes of the Sapoon Heights, tying into those of the Guards Brigade. The 95th field one picket here. Extending the chain of sentries north were three pickets of the 30th, stationed covering likely enemy approaches at the top of St. Clement's Ravine, the Barrier, and on the western slopes of the Quarry Ravine. These were under the command of Major Champion of the 95th. Here, the left pickets of the 2nd Brigade took up the chain of sentries. The area of Shell Hill was guarded by three pickets of the 49th, whose sentries tied into a single picket of the 41st down on the west jut. Across the Carinage Ravine lay the northernmost picket of the Light Division, formed by the 7th Royal Fusiliers in the vicinity of the Lancaster Battery. <laughs> 
Patrolling the divisional boundary formed by the Carinage Ravine, roved Captain Goodlake's guards' sharpshooters, who patrolled its length. Most of the morning was quiet, save for some cheering and the ringing of church bells coming from Sevastopol. But, near one o'clock in the afternoon, the 49th pickets were confronted by masses of Russians emerging from the gorges on the north of the heights. This was the commencement of what has become known as Little Inkerman, and deserving of examination here, as the actions and reactions molded thoughts and attitudes later on. Menshikov was following up his partially successful effort down on the plain at Balaklava with a reconnaissance in force designed to probe for Allied strength or weaknesses up on the northern flank of the siege lines. To this end, he ordered Colonel Fedorov in Sevastopol to establish himself with his own Burtrisk Regiment, two battalions of the Borodino Regiment, and four guns on the Inkerman Heights, whilst an additional battalion would guard his right flank by advancing along the Karinage Ravine. It was the picket of Captain Connolly of the 49th, positioned on Shell Hill, which first engaged. Seeing considerable numbers of Russians advancing toward him, he quickly collected his sentries and deployed his picket, some 60 men. They moved into extended order where they commenced firing. His company was confronting the left flank of a six battalion attack, numbering some 4,300 men in total. There must have been some dry mouths as the reality of the afternoon hit home. Coming on with three battalions in company columns, covered by skirmishers, followed by three more battalions in attack column, Connolly, covering a considerable 150 yards, was in for a fight. There doesn't appear to have been many issues with the serviceability of the weapons at this time. Muzzle-loading arms are not the acme of proof against damp and poor weather. Perhaps as they had only been loaded that morning, and action had been joined just after midday in indecent weather, the rifles were in good working order. As we shall see later on in November, this would play an important role in early morning action. Connolly's picket contested every inch of ground, and in fact the Russians were able to get to close quarters. Not at all for what would be considered normal for a picket to do. Connolly threw off his greatcoat so his men could identify him, and went at the nearest Russians. Pointing and cutting with his sword until it broke, astonishingly he then went to blows with his telescope. He was severely wounded in this little action, and was rescued by his men. They couldn't hold on forever and were forced by weight of numbers to withdraw off Shell Hill in the direction of the other 49th pickets to the west. For his efforts that day, he'd be awarded the Victoria Cross. Major Champion, commanding the right pickets from the barrier, advanced his two right pickets towards Shell Hill to join the third closer to that feature. He moved his little command to a position just south of Shell Hill, where he extended with the intention of supporting Connolly and the remainder of the 49th pickets fighting atop that feature. As mentioned, Connolly withdrew slightly west, consolidating with the remainder of his regiment's pickets. Notwithstanding the congested nature of the ground cover Ready. in places and the proximity of the Russians, Connolly's men, indeed all the pickets, would have made efforts to consolidate into extended order. The men of the files, spaced out in the underbrush, would work together, covering one another as they steadily withdrew. One man remaining loaded, whilst the other man moved and reloaded in his new position. In the perfect world, all this could be coordinated by whistle and voice, but chances are that the brush and the broken nature of the ground forced the men of the pickets to work with more initiative and with less supervision, as they made their best efforts to withdraw generally with their comrades to the left and to the right. They doing Ready. the same with them. Thus, the 49th pickets and the pickets of the 30th under Champion became abreast of each other as they confronted the six battalions of Russians advancing on Shell Hill. While the action on Shell Hill was developing, another fight was beginning on the left flank in the Karinage Ravine. Captain Goodlake, commanding the 30 or so men of the guard sharpshooters, had pushed down the ravine, probing for the enemy. He had left the balance of his men in a blocking position and had moved forward to reconnoiter some caves present in the walls of the ravine, just forward of the west jut. The Russian flanking column of some 500 men had been able to get close to that position due to the nature of the ground 
and while engaging the sharpshooters at close range, had cut off Goodlake and his sergeant in the cave. After a moment's hesitation, the two burst from their hiding place, clubbing and bayoneting while they sprinted towards their own line. Dressed in greatcoats, in the confusion, the Russians didn't recognize them, and they were able to cross the gap between the two sides and rejoin their men. By now, Champion had consolidated on the right, and the left pickets were now under the command of Major Eamon of the 41st. The Russian numbers began to bear, and they were able to skirt the flanks of the somewhat disjointed British skirmish line, and generally the pickets retired in the direction of Home Ridge. With the pickets having vacated Shell Hill, the Russians pushed up and over the crest. As the hill became clear, the four guns brought forward as part of their task came into action and began engaging what they could see of the British pickets. The second line of Russian battalions remained for the time being behind Shell Hill. Gradually the British gave ground. Captain Goodlake had withdrawn to a shallow trench dug across the Karidage Ravine at its junction with the Mikryakov Glen and were holding firm. The sharpshooters of the Guards Brigade made good use of their Minya rifles and were able to hold the Russian naval troops pressing up the ravine at bay. It seems fantastic on the outset that 30 men could hold off a battalion of Russians, but the tight confines of the ground and the effective fire put down by the guardsmen did the trick, and the Russian commander could not motivate his men to charge. For the time being, the left flank was holding out, and as yet, some reinforcements were making their way down off the Victoria Ridge. Men of the Rifle Brigade were on the way. For his actions and leadership that day, Goodlake was awarded the Victoria Cross. Eventually, the picket had withdrawn to a point where the right, under Champion, had reached the barrier at the top of the Quarry Ravine. Once there, he called for his last remaining picket, one fielded from his own regiment, the 95th. Thus, the pickets had consolidated on a line across the Inkerman Heights, with the right flank anchored on the barrier and the left flank out towards the Carinage Ravine. From the outset, Evans' plan was to fight a conventional defensive action, with the pickets engaging out in front, but retiring in time to allow for the remainder of the division, along with reinforcements, to concentrate at Home Ridge, where the main battle would be fought. He had also sent for reinforcements. The first of these to arrive was H Battery of the Royal Artillery. Thus, with his own artillery in place, Evans had 18 guns positioned along the breastwork atop Home Ridge. Behind these guns, waiting in reserve for the critical moment, was the remainder of the 2nd Division. A wing of the 30th, the 55th, 7 companies of the 95th, along with 7 companies of the 41st, the 47th, and a wing of the 49th. Calls had come back from the pickets for reinforcements, but Evans, mindful of his plan to fight the main battle at Home Ridge, would not send any. As ammunition waned at the barrier, he relented and sent two companies forward, one of the 30th and the light company of the 41st to the barrier and the left flank, respectively. They arrived in the nick of time, and the extra bayonets and ammunition they brought with them solidified the defense. As the battle coalesced at the barrier and the front line of Russian battalions advanced down the slope, the rear columns made a move to follow up the advance. This gave Evans' guns a perfect target, as they now had Russian battalion columns in full view without them being screened by friendly pickets. They presented a large target on the forward slope of Shell Hill. The 18 guns crashed out, and soon the advance of the Russian second line collapsed, with one battalion rushing forward and left into the quarry ravine searching for cover, and the remaining two beating a hasty retreat back over Shell Hill. With his front battalions unsupported, Fedorov ordered a general withdrawal and the forward Russian battalions began to withdraw back over Shell Hill, taking the guns with them. The pickets, whose ammunition supply allowed them to, began to follow up this withdrawal, and Evans picked this time as the appropriate moment to push back. He committed the 41st, the 95th, and a wing of the 30th from their positions on Home Ridge, and these battalions marched forward in open column, heading for the West Jut, Shell Hill, and the Barrier respectively. The Russians vacated Shell Hill, and the naval troops in the Karinage Ravine melted away, 
by this time having been faced by Goodlake and a number of reinforcements from the 41st, the 30th, as well as a detachment of the Rifle Brigade from the Light Division. The fighting was over for the time being, and the 2nd Division's area was secure. There were many lessons taken away from the action of the 26th of October, and these would stand in good stead if the Russians again tried to threaten the Inkerman Heights. For the Russians, it served as a crucial reconnaissance of British dispositions on the Inkerman Heights. They had been able to ascertain the location and strengths of the 2nd Division positions, as well as confirm that their artillery could reach Home Ridge from Shell Hill. They had also confirmed routes and various axes of advance for any subsequent attacks. For the British, it gave an excellent understanding of how the ground could be fought. Time and space considerations were very much brought to the forefront, amongst which, critically, was the time it would take for reinforcements to arrive from other parts of the British and French lines. Luckily, as it was, these additional forces had not been required on the 26th of October. Some, including the energetic Brigadier Penafather, commanding the 1st Brigade of the 2nd Division, had realized that in order to concentrate enough men on the Inkerman Heights to counter any large-scale attack by the Russians, more time would be needed than any picket line, however steady, could provide, if left to its own devices. Evans' plan of fighting from Home Ridge had worked this day, but, as we shall see, when Menchikov decided to attack on the 5th of November, the defense of the Heights would have to be conducted using a considerably different method. This brings us to the end of Part 2 of the Battle of Inkerman series. In the next part, we'll examine the battle proper, the events from early to mid-morning on November the 5th, 1854. The references used for the production of this video were many and varied. The late Michael Barthorpe's Crimean uniforms and Heroes of the Crimea were of particular interest. In addition, the works of Patrick Mercer, the Osprey book on Inkerman, as well as his own book, Give Them a Volley and Charge, were very useful. Hugh Small's work, The Crimean War, and Michael Springman's The Guards Brigade in the Crimea rounded out the collection of modern books. The use of the historical work written in the 1870s by Kinglake provided a reasonable, detailed account of the steps and actions as seen at Inkerman. And to round it out, because it is British muzzleloaders after all, the Infantry Manual, which was an abstract written in 1847 of the earlier 1833 drill manual. This was the drill book that the infantry used during the Crimean War. A very special thank you goes to Harry, a serving member of the Grenadier Guards, who sent along a bearskin plume and a valise plate that did duty as the ammunition pouch plate for the shooting vignettes featuring grenadiers. Thanks as well to Hugh Small of hughsmall.co.uk for the provision of his 3D imagery. This was of great help in producing all the 3D map work seen in the presentation. As well to Patrick Mercer for the use of some of his modern photographs of the area. These helped greatly in placing the contours and maps in a better light. Thanks too to my friends of the Die Hard Company of the Victorian Military Society for the use of some of their photographs regarding their Crimean War impressions. If you're in need of exceptionally high quality and historic ammunition for your P-53 Enfield, then stop by Brett's website, papercartridges.com. His work is of the highest quality, and his cartridges are the closest thing you'll find to an original anywhere. If you'd like to support the channel, please stop by our Patreon page. The link is in the description below. And for more information on projects and updates between videos, follow us on our Facebook page.